Hey everyone. This week I have a, a very special guest on my channel and somebody that uh, has been very, very influential and important to me and my recovery from Scientology. This is a woman that I have discovered very early on after coming out of Scientology and looking for answers as to what the hell happened to me and why did I go through all of the years of uh, difficulty, as one word for it, uh, with Scientology. And, uh, and her name is Yanya Lalich, and she is a uh, professor and researcher and uh, has been working in the field of uh, destructive cults and cult advocacy for many, many years. I am delighted, I am amazed and delighted and happy uh, beyond words that she and I are finally getting a chance to do something on camera together uh, because, like I said, she was uh, instrumental in laying a foundation for me that led to where I'm at now and recovering from Scientology and helping others to recover from Scientology and other destructive cults. So, Yanya Lalich, welcome to my channel. Well, thank you, Chris. I'm happy to be here at I... long last. We tried for <laughs> but we finally did it. <laughs> yes, yes, it has, been, uh, it has been a little while in the making. Uh, so first off, I, I, have, I have quoted from your work and discussed your work at length on my channel, uh, so any longtime watchers will definitely recognize your name. But let's go ahead, for those who don't know who you are, let's go ahead and talk about you for a second. What's your background and uh, what are your credentials in this field? Okay, well, I'll start... Um... I guess the, the most important thing is that I was in a cult myself, uh, which I joined in, around 1974. I was about 30 years old. I had already graduated from university and had lived in Europe for a while. Um, I was, it was a political cult, and we were, we were purportedly working towards social change in America. Uh, we had a female leader. Um, it was a very restrictive certainly emotionally and psychologically abusive, less so physically, although there was some physical abuse. Um, I was, for the most part, always in leadership, and so uh, that was not pleasant because I was in the inner circle around the leader, and she was very, she was alcoholic and erratic. And anyway, we all got out. We The, the cult imploded, which doesn't happen very often, and we... Uh, expelled our leader and dissolved the organization and everybody got out and at that point there were about 120 uh, full-time members, uh, what we called cadre members. So when I got out I was about 41. Um, I barely knew how to cross the street at that point. Um, I went to New York. I had been living primarily in San Francisco so I went to New York to get a job and I wanted to get as far away from San Francisco as I could. <laughs> Um, I got a job in publishing because in the cult, one of my responsibilities was to build our publishing house and run the publishing house. So it was a skill I had acquired. Um, and I was amazed at how dysfunctional I was. I mean, here I was, I was 41. I barely knew how to open a bank account. I, you know, and I knew I had graduated from college with honors. I'd had a Fulbright fellowship. I was like, what? And just like you just said, what in the hell happened to me? Um, I couldn't read the front page of the newspaper without my eyes going kablooey. And so, uh, but I got a job and I was working and I'd get home at night and I would drink and try to write and, and I tried to find things to read and I, I wasn't very successful because at that time, this was about 1986, everything was about religious cults and I thought, well, this doesn't quite relate to me, you know, whatever. And, um, so two important things happened, um, and I hope that I'm not going on too long about this. No, but, no, please carry on. Okay. Two important things happened. One was that I was uh, proofreading on the side for my boss who ran two different companies and to earn more money because he paid me a pittance. And I was proofreading. He had a psychi psychology and psychiatry publishing house. So I was home at night in my little apartment, and I was proofreading the very first book that came out about post-traumatic stress disorder in Vietnam veterans. It was basically the breakthrough book uh, by Charles, Dr. Charles Figley. So I'm proofreading this book sitting at my desk and I, I'm reading this stuff and I suddenly just welled up and I started crying and I'm like, oh my God, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm experiencing. You know, I'm not a Vietnam vet. Like what? So that was like some kind of 
awakening for me, although I still hadn't really figured out what I should do about that. And then very shortly after that, my boss was taking me out for dinner. It was my six month anniversary at his job. And so he was taking me out to this fancy French restaurant. And, and he said, you know, Yanya, you're really an excellent worker. Your writing is great. You do really well. You know, I, I, I'm never unhappy with your work. Everything's always on time. Blah, 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 blah. Of course, I was a former cult member, so of course I knew how to work morning, noon, and night. But anyway. Yeah, it's not just, it's not just Scientology that inculcates that in people. That's right. <laughs> right. And so, and, but then he said, but you know what? He said, you've been working here six months, and I've never, I've never seen you smile, and I've never heard you laugh. And that just hit me like a ton of bricks because I kind of consider myself a funny person. I joke a lot. I have a good, great sense of humor, I think. And when he said that, I was just stunned. And I realized that I didn't really know how I was projecting. I really didn't know what my persona was. You know, does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Um, I, I was completely out of touch with who, 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 who I was presenting myself as and what my emotions were or should be or... So at that point, I got myself into therapy. And fortunately, in New York, there was a cult clinic where the therapists specialized in post-cult after effects and ran groups for families and things. And so I was very lucky because one of the big problems still today is therapists don't understand when they get a former cult member in their office. So luckily, I had this great therapist and I got myself together in a much, much better way. And... And then I started thinking about, I started reading and putting things together. And, 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 and the other thing that saved me was Robert Lifton's work. Because Lifton's work, Thought Reform and the uh, Psychology of, uh, of Thought Control, or I forget, the totalism. Totalism, yeah. Thought, thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism is about communist China. And so it was a, it was a communist framework, which was, which was what my experience was. We were communists, right? And so... I was like, oh, it's not just religious cults. I was in a cult. This is this is what my life was. So these things all came together, and, and I started reading a lot, and I decided I wanted to go on to graduate school. Well, it took me about 10 years to make that decision. As you probably know, it's very difficult to make decisions when you get <laughs> yes. out. Yes, <laughs> yes, it is. Everything is a little shaky, a little right. uncertain. Exactly. Not so quite sure what to think is the right thing okay. to do anymore. Oh, yeah. There. Exactly. So I finally got myself off to graduate school and um, got my Ph.D. in um, in sort of a multidisciplinary sociology degree. And so I think I was 55 when I graduated from graduate school or 60, 60, I guess. It was something. Oh, I was starting to get old. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but okay. I think that's important for people to know because I have so many people tell me, oh, I want to go to school, but I'm too old. And I'm like, hey, look, you're never too old. You know, if you've got the determination, you can do it. And I've told you that. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's that. right. So um, I got my PhD and I surprisingly got a teaching job at uh, one of the state universities in California because I didn't think anyone would hire me at that age. Um, so I have been teaching sociology at California State University, Chico, which is Northern California, north of Sacramento, and I just recently retired. So that that's sort of a snapshot of my academic career. Um, okay. And now that I'm retired, I'm a professor emerita, which is a lovely status. Uh, <laughs> and I get to, when I make restaurant reservations, I get to say it's Dr. Lalich, and they think I'm a medical doctor, so they give me good tables. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, um, throughout all of that, I, I did a lot of work on um, working with former members, working with families, working sometimes with somebody in a cult, trying to figure out what to do. My first book uh, came out in 94, and that was called Captive Hearts, Captive Minds. Yep. And it was primarily a recovery book uh, for former members. Um, and then I wrote a couple of books with Margaret Singer, uh, which was really a lot of fun because she was a character. And, of course, at the time she was the you know preeminent person uh, speaking about cults and educating people about cults. She's the uh, one who started the Cult Awareness Network, is that right? Or was well, prominent in that group? <laughs> Not the Cult Awareness Network. Margaret was, or Dr. Singer, was uh, more involved with 
uh, the American Family Foundation, which is the early name of the International Cultic Studies Association. Oh, okay. Okay. So AFF uh, and CAN, Cult Awareness Network, existed pretty much in the same decades, in the 70s and 80s and into the 90s. CAN, as you know, got... Yeah, smashed. they got assumed by out. Scientology, who bought them yeah. out, actually, and uh, yeah. after they, after Scientology sort of forced them into bankruptcy and then yeah. took and it over. And now if you contact the Cult Awareness Network, you are literally contacting the Church of Scientology. No, I know. It's horrible. It's, I, I remember saying at the time, because when they had that auction and Scientology bought the name and the logo and the phone number, and I thought... How is the court allowing this? It's it's like, you know, it's like selling the uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center to the Ku Klux Klan or something like that. It's like being sold to your ideological enemy, you know. So anyway, um, so uh, so over the years, I've done a lot of writing, a lot of speaking, a lot of media, uh, working with families, as I said, working somewhat with the government, um, trying to make connections between cults and terrorism, um, and and then doing more writing. I just have a book that came out this year and and I don't know if I'll continue to write. Um I'm I'm seventy almost seventy three now, so I'm thinking maybe it's time to slow down, but my life hasn't slowed down a minute, so I don't know about that. Um so Totally. That, that's sort of in a nutshell who I am. Okay. Well thank you for that. That's a that's a good complete story there. Uh, and you have uh, been working with then uh, American Family Foundation, and then that's that's evolved into the International Cultic Studies Association. What is that group, and what is when and how do you work with those guys? Well, I haven't worked with them much recently. Um, okay. AFF started back in the '70s when uh, John Clark, who was a, a psychiatrist on the East Coast, and Margaret Singer was on the West Coast. And Margaret was getting a lot of calls about, because she lived in Berkeley near the campus, and she was getting a lot, a lot of calls from parents about their kids getting recruited into, primarily at that time, either the Unification Church or the Moonies um, and um, the Hare Krishna. I mean, both those cults were very active on, around the campus at that time. And since she had done early studies with Lifton and Shine during the Korean War research that they were doing, she, she began to recognize, oh, this is the same thing that we saw in these so people coming out of these POW camps or the people who went to the Chinese thought reform schools. Um, and and she was in touch with Dr. Clark on the East Coast, so he actually started the American Family Foundation. He eventually passed away. Um, and the American Family Foundation, now ICSA, is, is essentially an organization that um, – puts on conferences yearly to um, have, it's kind of a gathering place for uh, helping professionals in the field, helping professionals who want to learn more, former members, um, you know, anyone who's like interested in the field. And then there's always, you know, several days worth of panels and speakers and keynote speeches and things like that. They also publish a journal and, um, have some smaller workshops that they put on throughout the year. So right now, ICSA is pretty much the only secular uh, cult education organization in the country, at least that I'm aware of. I was going to I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. yeah. Either here or in the United States or elsewhere, are there any other similar groups or activist groups working to educate or inform about destructive cults? Oh yes, there are there are plenty of activist groups. I mean, there are, there are some small groups around the country that just, you know, like there's something called Free Minds that works in the um, Minneapolis area. There's some other small groups around the country that work um, to educate and, and help former members. Uh, there are many, many uh, organizations in Europe um, that are cult education or cult of, you know, whatever you want to call them. I belong to a, a European Federation, it's called FECRIS, it's, um, it's based in Marseille, and it's essentially a federation of European organizations that uh, do research and awareness on cults. So we, that organization, and I'm on the board, that organization meets once a year, and representatives come from all over Europe and Eastern Europe, and, and they are the representatives of the organizations that work in those countries. So they're reporting on what they're doing, they're presenting 
perhaps on what are the most active cults in their country right now or some legal cases or whatever. Each conference usually has a theme. Um, and that's, that I found is a really fantastic organization. They're very committed, dedicated people. And in most of the countries, they're very connected with the government. Um, they get government support, unlike anything here in America. Um, and so that, that's been really exciting for me to be a part of that organization um, and meet these people from all over the world. And uh, I've, I've really enjoyed that. And I've made some really excellent contacts. Excellent. Okay, good. Well, we'll um, probably post some links to that, that group down below in the description section on this video so people can check that out. You have put together a model. Uh, you know, we, we're familiar with, and I've interviewed Steve Hassan and, and his bite model, um, you know, which, which was certainly informative to me when I read his book on, on uh, combating cult mind control and, and that kind of work. And it's been helpful to provide a structure or a framework on which to be able to look and evaluate various groups or organizations. But, but you, uh, you describe this as bounded choice. Yes. yes I love yeah. that term, bounded choice. <laughs> it, it really, you know, it, you're bound into this, this series right. of choices, really. You know, it's, it's a great expression. Um, Thank you. Could you describe, you know, what, the, what that is when you came up with that and what the characteristics of that are? Sure. Um, well, Bounded Choice uh, was sort of the result of my uh, dissertation when I went to graduate school. I essentially did a comparative study of the cult that I was in, which was called the Democratic Workers Party. That was the background name. Uh, we had a lot of front groups, but the Democratic Workers Party or the DWP was the cult. Um, and it was, a you know, obviously a left wing Marxist Leninist cult. Um, and I compared that that cult and those experiences of the people in that cult and all the literature from the past and everything that I still had with the Heaven's Gate cult, which people might remember is the cult that uh, committed mass suicide, if you want to call it that, um, in 90, 98, maybe. I can't really remember the exact right. year. Right, that was Marshall Applewhite's. Right, Marshall group. Applewhite. Um, and the 38 people who committed suicide, a couple committed suicide a little later. And it was a, a sort of um, new age, quasi-Christian UFO cult, even though it wasn't really about UFOs, but people mostly like to call it that. So I thought, okay, here, here are two completely different cults. They couldn't be more different. Here's the DWP who wants to change you know, the social relations in our country, get rid of racism, sexism, you know, all the isms, poverty, et cetera, deal with reality. And then here's this cult who wants to escape the earth, who believes they're beings from another, what they called another level above human. And, um, and their goal was to get back to that other level. And that at some point, the spaceship was going to come to pick them up and do that. So you couldn't have two more different cults with more different goals. Um, and of course, in, in doing my analysis, I found, you know, there were in, indeed many more similarities than differences once you broke everything down. Right. And probably people who are familiar with cults or have had an experience and looked at other cults, you, you realize um, most of the cults follow some kind of pattern and your cult might call it this and my cult might call it that, but it's essentially the same mechanism of control or whatever. So out of that, I came up with um, my model and my theory called bounded choice. Um, Cause I was trying to look at, this was, I was working on this shortly after the Heaven's Gate suicides. And so, you know, everybody was flummoxed by that and trying to figure out, you know, why would people do that? Why would people do that? So I was trying to, help explain to my reading audience or whoever um, why people in cults do things that seem irrational to, to those of us on the outside, but are extremely rational to those on the inside, right? So bounded choice is a, is a, a model that has four aspects. And um, the first is, of course, the charismatic leader. And um, every cult starts with a charismatic leader and someone who has uh, 
been accepted as as a charismatic figure and has been given that authority is immediately in a in a power in, in a, a balance imbalance of power right yeah. if you think someone's charismatic they automatically have power over you right because you think they're so special right whether it's a movie star or whoever right that's right so you've got the charismatic leader who's the all-powerful um head of this thing who's offering some kind of solution some kind of salvation in whatever ideology it might be political religious losing weight earning money you name it right and because this is the all-powerful charismatic leader there are no checks and balances there's there's no way to hold that person accountable it, that's just how it is so that's the first factor the second factor is what i call the transcendent belief system and the transcendent belief system is a, a belief system that offers you everything it gives you the answer to the past the present and the future right it, it's an all-encompassing system um, and it's all inclusive and yet at the same time it's exclusive right only certain people believe in that system or, or that ideology um, and so the difference between how I look at transcendent belief system in cults as opposed to say a mainstream mainstream church is going to have a transcendent belief system most churches or most many organizations that have very high ideals you know believe in something really super special happening or that there's some higher power right the difference in a cult is that part of this system is a requirement that you go through what I call the recipe for change. You have to go through a personal transformation and you have to go through it in the way that the cult dictates. So again, this is different from a mainstream religion that might say to you, oh, be nice to your neighbors. You know, when someone new moves into your neighborhood, take them a tray of cookies, right? But nobody's coming and checking up on you and seeing if you really took someone a tray of cookies, right? right. And even the Catholic Church, they might say, oh, don't use birth control. But I can guarantee you there's probably plenty of Catholics who use birth control, right? Because they're not in your bedroom at night checking on you. So there may be these ideals and there may be these sort of ways of good living that are being imparted from a mainstream church. But that's very different from the kind of very structured uh transformation that a person has to go through in order to be eligible to be part of this charismatic leader's fantasy yep. right so that's one and two charismatic authority transcendent belief system and then how does this all stick together so there's two parts to that there are what i call the systems of control and the systems of influence so the systems of control are the very obvious rules regulations the whole indoctrination program you know, daily rules, everything from how many babies you can have or not have to how you should dress, to how you should eat, to where you should live, all of that kind of stuff, which is going to vary in different cults. And then the systems of influence is the emotional and psychosocial manipulation. And that, and that in many ways is more powerful than the systems of control, because people generally aren't recognizing that they're being manipulated in that way. So by using fear and guilt and shame and anxiety and humiliation and love and lots of peer pressure, um, though, those elements are going to keep you conforming. And that's what cults are all about. Cults are all about self-sacrifice and conformity. So the four of them together, uh, in, in my view, form what I call the self-sealing system. You're enclosed within the system that has all the answers. And you have to often, uh, especially if you're not someone who was born in the cult, right? If you come in as an adult, you have to reframe your life and your past life, your past experiences in order to fit the ideology of the group. So who, the people who used to be your nice parents are now bourgeois running dogs or Satan or right, whatever That's it right. might be. Right. Yeah, you can redefine so, everything in your life exactly. against the new paradigm that you've accepted. Exactly. So you're in this self-seeing system, and as the indoctrination is going on, and as you're more and more enclosed in that system, you as a, as a good devoted member begin to internalize the beliefs and the behaviors and the ideals of the system. 
the more you internalize it, the more you've cut yourself off from everything else. And in most cases, you're not even allowed to entertain anything else. Um, you might go to a job every day, but your mind is with the cult, right? You right. might be going to a job just to recruit other people or sell your papers or whatever it might be. And you might be a very good worker and no one may even suspect that you're in a cult. But in your mind, you know you're in this, quote, other world. You're kind of in another reality, this bounded reality. So the more that this belief system is internalized and you've adopted, wholly adopted that system, you get to what I call a state of mind of bounded choice. And so bounded choice is a social, social psychological state where, yes, you may be given choices. Nobody's literally holding a gun to your head. And, and I took it to this extent because I wanted to go, I wanted to confront the whole free will issue, mm. uh, right? Because people always say, well, it's their choice. They joined, da, da, da. But so, yes, no one's holding a gun to your head. And they may say to you, leave if you want to, or don't kill that person I just told you to kill, or whatever it might be, right? But you know, as a good member, you know exactly the choice that you have to make. You know exactly what the right decision is, or you will lose everything. And in some cases, you may fear you'll lose your life um, because it's been presented to you in that way. So that that's what bounded choice is. It's really a way to express the the intensity of having adopted the belief system and the inability to truly act with free will, um, that your free will is actually distorted by the um, by the beliefs of the leader and the beliefs of the cult that you have taken on. Right, very good, very good way of putting all that. And just to give an example of this, that might be outside of of what most people think is a you know a cult situation. Uh, in your in your recent book, which we're going to get to shortly here, you talk about uh, Enron, mm -hmm. that old company uh, that 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 tanked pretty hard. Uh, lost people, a lot of people, a lot of money, and, and a lot of other things. Uh, but you talk about that corporate environment as a, in, in the same terms, under bounded choice. Right. What led you to that conclusion about a, a company? I mean, no, nobody really, hardly anybody, you know, I, I'll bet you in, in the whole time you were discussing everything you just said about bounded choice, people were thinking of examples of Scientology, you know, the, the, the Hare Krishnas or some religious group. But, but let's now turn that and go, no, actually, here's another pretty wild example, right? How did, how did you come to that? Well, that example actually is uh, drawn from the work of a colleague of mine named Dennis Tourish, uh, who lives in England or Scotland. Um, and, and he himself had been in a political cult and now he's a professor and he's, uh, He's in uh, business, he's a business pro professor. Um, and so most of his work has to do with business related things. And so he's done some excellent articles and books on um, the difference between transactional and transformational leadership. And then he did several articles on Enron uh, showing how as a company, it took on all, all of the characteristics of a cult. Um, the, the things that people were supposed to believe, the way they were supposed to behave, how the leaders were regarded, etc. I myself have um, worked on several different cases uh, of other business cults. And business cults are far more common than I think we like to think about. And a lot of that is due to the influence of, of the New Age stuff that got really popular in the 80s. Um, you know, with crystals and shamans and speaking to ascended beings and, and all of that kind of stuff. And the the sort of leadership training programs that came out of that, like, you know, Est and Landmark and uh, Lifespring and on and on and on. And then now there's thousands of offshoots. And those groups um, are generally within the inner circles, within the, the company itself is very, is, is cult-like. The people who go to those programs may not be considered cult members. They're essentially supporting it financially and recruiting their friends to come to it or whatever. And some of them may be recruited into the ranks and become staff. But there, there's absolutely a, a, a plethora of those types of groups. 
and they're consulting with the government, they're consulting with all kinds of big corporations and companies and, and federal, state, city level, getting into the schools. Um, and I think it's one of the areas of cults that we don't pay enough attention to. Big time. I, I warn my students, I say, look, when you get out and get a job and they're going to want you to go to some training, don't go. <laughs> you know, you don't have to go. And That's right. And you know, they may threaten to fire you if you don't go, but then you can t complain to the EEOC because they're essentially teaching you a new belief. So it's it's an, it's a, re a religious invasion, so to speak, uh, and you're protected against that. So, right. and you know, of course, Scientology has done the same thing. Oh, they were, they were, they, I, I think in some ways were leading the charge. Yes. Uh, in, in many ways. I mean, Est, Landmark, Forum, these all spring from Scientology in many yes. ways. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and uh, yeah, this leadership seminars and training and these speeches that get given by by people who are paid an awful lot of money mm -hmm. uh, to go around and do motivational speaking or leadership training. Uh, right. You know, if, if you were to actually, you know, we, we know this happens. We sort of right. see it or hear about it. But like you said, I don't think a whole lot of attention is paid to. And well, some of the what are they saying? <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, and some of the practices are, are, are very abusive, very abusive uh, that go on in, in some of these seminars. I mean, the case that I worked on uh, was just horrific. They would bring all these people out to this place in the middle of nowhere in Nevada. And, you know, of course, they had to turn over their phones and they couldn't talk to anybody the whole time they were there. And they had to go into these meetings and essentially shout, literally shout for hours because the leader said he got this from some Japanese guru and and they would come home hoarse and unable to speak. And then they had to do fire walking and, you know, all these things. People were having heart seizures. And I mean, it, it, it's not just like, oh, leadership training, you're sitting in a ballroom and you're getting a little bit humiliated. But some of the practices are very harmful. Right. Right. There's a reason they want to get you up in the mountains away from yes. Yes. Oh, everything absolutely. and everybody, you know, yeah, like, that unsettles you. Yes, that, that's right. And, and you are to that degree uh, powerless. You're, yeah. in a, you're in an environment where you have right. given over. Right. Makes you, you vulnerable. Know. That's exactly. right. Again, a bounded choice. Yes. You know? <laughs> All you right. Did. Well, now let's <laughs> let's talk you about. You passed the exam. <laughs> well, yeah, because uh, you know, I, I said I love the expression because it really uh, they're very effective. They're very they're very well chosen words. You know, I, I made the point uh, I think recently with somebody I was talking to on this channel about how you know if you're in a situation where you um, or in a group, you know, you can almost it, you could almost judge whether you're in a cult or not by. You know, what's the answer to the question, can you say no? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Can you say no? Can you say no? I, no you know, and what kind of reaction are you going to get? Right. Well, you know, that's a, that's a pretty good uh, indicator of, of what right. you're involved in. Or what's, uh, the, what's the answer to the question, do they answer your questions? <laughs> yeah, that's right. another one. That's right. Very, that's right. Information control. Uh, okay, so now let's talk about this book. Now, this is called Escaping Utopia. And uh, this was a book that you wrote with Carla McLaren. Uh, mm -hmm. This just came out. And it's not actually that big. But you'll notice my, my bookmark is not finished with it yet. And I'm going to tell you the reason why is because uh, I've, been, I've been reading this book for a few weeks now, off and on. But it is a very, for a, for a former cult member, this is a difficult book to read. Because you are quoting many people. This is about growing up in destructive cults. This is for second gens. And, uh, and some, uh, you know, I, I have had a pretty high tolerance of, uh, for nonsense and the sort of things that go on in these groups. But I did not know some of what is described from members of, uh, what was it, exclusive brethren, mm -hmm. the family, uh, mm -hmm. you know, these, these, uh, the TM, Mm -hmm. uh, I had no, I did not know that that kids were brought along and just left on their own. I mean, basically parental abandonment uh, mm -hmm. when the parents become part of these uh, uh, of TM and they get really serious about it. This transcendental meditation, and mm -hmm. they go to one of these locations and they drag the kids along, and the parents are spending eight, nine, ten, twelve hours a day meditating, and the kids are just running around, you know, and and it's not and it actually worse than that because then there's some controls put on these kids that that make it really bad 
So I've had a little bit of a hard time getting through this book, but it has been amazing, uh, amazingly educational for me, as difficult as it is to read some of these stories, as heartbreaking as it is mm -hmm. to read about the instances of sexual liberties taken with some of these children, the miseducation. And I just wanted to make this point, and then I wanted to get your what you wanted to say about your, your new book here. Um, Raising children in a cult, I think, is doubly destructive than I think a lot of people realize because it's not only destructive to their well-being because they're, they're not just miseducated with cult doctrine, but they're actually denied a real education and, and real facts that would otherwise be taught to them like if they went to a school. Those are being rewritten by the cult members. So they deny science, they deny psychology, liberal arts, you know, philosophy, any of this stuff is totally foreign concepts. And, and, it's, and it's done in a premeditated fashion. The cult wants these kids to be kept away from information that would lead them in any way to question what's going on. <laughs> that's, that's kind of doubly worse than just being indoctrinated into a cult's belief system, which is what happens to adults who join these groups. Right. You know. And also, they're denied genuine developmental stages. I mean, their development is, is almost in every case completely stunted, not just because of the education, but because they don't experience the same extent or the same degree of parental love and attachment that's very important to a young child growing up. They're often separated, raised, sometimes raised by other kids, sent off to other families. Um, they are sometimes working. I mean, the, 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 the young man I interviewed from 12 tribes, I mean, they all start working at five years old and they work all day and all night and they're not well fed. And, you know, he talked about having to eat toothpaste because he was so hungry. I mean, so it's not just the lack of education or the distorted education of the cult, but you know, it's the lack of any kind of social uh, connection with anyone outside the cult, any kind of other inputs, uh, being able to, you know, when you're a kid, you go through all these things and, and part of growing up is learning how to sort everything out and learning how to figure out what, what you want to believe kind of establishing your own moral code and deciding what you want to do when you grow up and, and you go through, some tough times and challenges and, and you wrestle your way through it, usually with the help of your parents or your peers or whatever. They don't have that kind of genuine experience. It's all forced on them. Right. And they have, and because they're children, their bodies are small. They right. can literally be picked up and moved right. around. And no one is going to challenge a parent's authority to do that. Right. So, they literally are powerless. They are in a, a situation where they have no control, no power whatsoever right. to right. make any decisions about yeah. this. Yes. I wanted to contrast this a little bit. Uh, one thing that I get from some people is, well, all religions are cults. Well, they're all bad. Well, everything, you know, that has to do with this is bad. And I often, you know, I, I reject that idea because, uh, because, well, because I have my reasons. But I wanted to ask, what, what do you, what, what's your response to something like that? Because we're talking about the family, exclusive brethren, 12 tribes. I mean, these groups are, are high control groups. Right. How is that different from being raised Catholic, let's say, even, even in a fundamentalist home? Well, to me, the difference in, in a, with a healthy religion is that I'd say the primary difference for me is that you're not worshiping the guy right in front of you or the woman right in front of you. You're worshiping some higher principle, whether that's God or Buddha or Allah or a tree or <laughs> peace or, you know, whatever it might be in a mainstream religion. Right. And you're not being told, literally being told what to do by the pastor in front of you. Now, there may be some restrictions, as, as I discussed earlier, with the Catholic Church or with some other churches. Um, but there is also, in, in any, almost every mainstream church is going to belong to a larger denomination. And there's going to be a chain of accountability. 
So if you think your pastor's doing something wrong or you notice your pastor's, you know, flirting with the choir leader and they seem to spend a lot of time together, you can report him. And I have and I know of cases where in, in various denominations, the, the, the next level above starts checking up on that pastor and people have been removed from their positions. Now, yes, it took years for the sexual abuse going on in the Catholic Church to get really revealed and talked about and recompense being paid and things like that. Um, because the Catholic Church is, you know, I'd say on the on the continuum of mainstream churches at the stricter end, of course, and has a lot of power and a lot of money. So in a mainstream church, you should be able to express your autonomy, your freedom of mind, and more than unless you're living in a very small community where everybody's going to the same church or on a compound of something that's probably not a church but a cult. In in regular society, you might go to church on Sunday. You might even go to one other service a week. But the rest of the time, you're surrounded by all kinds of inputs, right? You've got television, radio. You've got different kinds of friends. You may have relatives who are different religions or who are atheists. You might be arguing with Uncle Bob about whatever. I mean, there's there's many, many ways that you're getting all sorts of other input, which doesn't happen when you're in a cult. So as a, as a kid growing up, or even as a young adult, you have what I call reality checks, right? I mean, I talk with this about my students. If you're going out with a guy and he seems kind of weird, you can go to your girlfriends and say, hey, what do you think of Joe Schmo? You know, am I, am I right in dating him or, or is he a total, you know, totally off? And more than likely, they'll tell you what they think. Like, no, he's a Schmo, get rid of him, right? So you, you, have, wait, you have these reality checks. Whereas when you're in a cult, whether it's a religion or a, a non-religious cult, of which there are many, 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 not all cults are religious, first of all, but you don't have that opportunity for that feedback, for that outside input. And right. that's, where the, that's where the closed world comes in, that self-sealing world. Um, and, and today, I, I do believe one of the big problems today are the um, non-denominational small churches that are starting up these um, corner store churches or a church out of somebody's house and they're non-denominational meaning they don't belong to any larger synod or body right and they're just some guy who says yeah I'm just gonna start this in my living room with my wife and I'm gonna invite the neighbors and it may start out fine but then he starts to realize oh they're really listening to me I can tell them to do this I can tell them to do that and most people can't handle that level of power or adulation. And then things start to go wrong. And there's yep. nowhere for people to go. There's no one to go to and say, hey, I think um, Mr. Jones over here is getting a little out of hand. You either have to leave and maybe you're too invested by then or, you know, you, you keep going along with it. So the, the, the flurry, the absolute flurry of non-denominational churches in our country right now is of concern to me. Interesting. Interesting. I think accountability might be a key word there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what kind of accountability can you hold the group or its leadership to? Mm -hmm. And if there's no accountability, I mean, certainly Scientology, uh, you know, they're, they're not interested in, in answering to anybody. Right. 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 right? There's it, no suggestion boxes, right? <laughs> <laughs> not really. <laughs> or, or actually even more insidiously, there are these little boxes around mm -hmm. that you can write things to, but you know what they use those for? To target who's being hey, annoyed, who's being sessions. a troublemaker. That's hey, right. Oh, hey. this report <laughs> comes from Joe. Hi, Joe. Come on over here. Let's have a chat. You know, right. when right. did you start feeling disaffected with David Miscavige? Right. So, the thing I like about this new book is um, at, at the end of each chapter, we have these checklists, um, like for the charismatic leader, for the belief system, for whatever that, you know, if you're in a group and you can do these things, you know, check off the ones that you would have a problem doing in your group. And if you've checked off several of those, well, you know, either try to get your group to change or if you can't, you're probably in the wrong group. And um, I think that that's one of the things I, I think this book is very helpful about is like giving people something to hold on to, to be, to be able to evaluate when they're getting involved with something or something they're already involved in. Yeah, absolutely. And the stories, like I said, are very heartbreaking, yeah. but informative and necessary. Yeah. Um, yes. You know, it's not about it's not about reading this and getting mad. It's 
it, it, although you will, there's no way you're going to read this book and you are going to have, you are going to go up and down uh, every emotional roller coaster and slide you can. Uh, because uh, I mean, if you're human, um, you know, I, 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 I'm a, like I said, I'm a well-read person, pretty smart, got a lot of words I know, uh, you know, but this is, this is just, oof, really, <laughs> it, it's rough, you know, it's rough, but really important um, to, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that there's like graphic detail or something like this, I'm just saying that these kids have been through a lot, and and their yeah. stories are are heartbreaking, okay. but it's but yeah. but you you use the quotes from the from these kids from these cult survivors to educate. Not yeah. it's not it's it's not meant to be salacious or something like right. that. Don't don't anybody right. misread what I'm saying here. Yeah. Um, what what do you think? Uh, let's talk about second gen for just a minute, right? There's a lot to say about it. You wrote a whole book about it, but what is the difference between somebody who you know, voluntarily gets involved in one of these groups versus somebody who's raised in it. But just to like, what are some key differences there, both in in what happens to them and in recovery it, once you get out of that group? How, you know, how is that addressed uh, between those two groups? Well, um, you know, first of all, when someone joins as an adult, depending on their age, but they've obviously had some life experience. Uh, they've had contact and experience in, you know, maybe not just where they live, but maybe they've traveled, they know where they have relatives, they have pro maybe gone to school. Uh, they have a, a variety of life experiences that they bring into the cult. Now, while you're in the cult, you might forget about those life experiences because you're not supposed to talk about your past life or whatever. Um, and depending on that, you may have more or less um, sort of resilience to what happens to you in the cult. Um, and you, when you get out of the cult, you know, assuming you get out of the cult, you will more than likely have more opportunities to find resources for recovery. For the kids who are born in cults, they have none of that. First of all, they didn't choose it. They in many cases, I mean, my book was based on interviews with 65 um, people who were born or raised in a cult who um, almost every one of them left on their own, either in adolescence or early adulthood, meaning they left without family, without an intervention. They just like got the hell out of there. Right. Um, and and then I was so they represented the 65 people represented 39 different cults. Um, and the striking thing for me was the level of abuse, the constancy of abuse of these kids in almost every single one of those cults, mm -hmm. um, sexual, physical, sometimes both, uh, obviously emotional and psychological. And when you're younger, of course, that kind of trauma has a, a much greater impact on you because your brain is forming, right? And so it's very different than, I'm not saying it's different than, you know, the trauma of a soldier who's, you know, saw his buddies killed and all. This is a different kind of, of trauma in most cases, but the trauma has a much greater effect on the brain and on the body through those young ages. And, and they don't have anything to fall back on as we did as adults who joined, right? Um, or as I did, I'm a, I think you were joined as an adult as well, right? Yeah. Actually, I was raised with it. Oh, you were raised. Oh, okay. Yeah, my parents got involved when I was about four. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. yeah, no, it's a, yeah, but yeah, was, I'm, I'm second gen. Okay, yeah. you're second gen. Um, so the, the impact is, is much greater. And um, I think the... Um, what I'm seeing now with the kids coming out, this is now the greatest population of ex-cult members coming out, are the, are the second and third generation. And I really see it as, as a public health issue. We have no resources for these people. That's right. They, they get out of the cult and two of, of the people I interviewed, two of one said, 
when I got out of the cult, I felt like I landed from Mars. In fact, one of the chapters is named, you know, I landed from Mars. Um, they get out in, in this world, especially if they were in a restrictive cult. Um, they don't know anything. They don't know how to get a driver's license. They don't know about GED. They don't know how to do a college application. They don't, you know, there, there was the woman's story in the book who paid thousands of, thousands of dollars to get some certificate. And then at the end of it, she found out the certificate was worthless because it was not an accredited institution. Yep. Well, how was she supposed to know you should check out things like that, right? So they don't get any of those basic skills that non-cult children presumably get through their childhood and through their adolescence, either from school, from their parents, from their friends, whatever it might be, right? Um, so they come out absolutely raw in a sense. Um, and they only know this one thing. And so they don't know who to trust. They don't know, they don't know if they have other relatives out there or not, you know, some might, but many don't. And the, um, well, the level of, um, struggle, I guess is the best word, the struggle to make a life for themselves. I mean, many of them end up on the streets. Um, end up in bad situations, um, and the, only, the the thing that has really helped, and something I really want to keep pushing, the thing that has really helped has been the internet, because so many so many children and and even adult former cult members have started these websites, right, and have started various um, helping groups. You know, there's safe passages which. People from Children of God started, which gives scholarships to kids. I mean, they don't have a ton of money, but they help with scholarships. They have a kind of underground railroad helping people when they come out. Here's a place to stay. Here's 25 bucks for the bus ride. 12 tribes, people who've left 12 tribes, the kids have the same kind of thing. Um, and so many of these groups have started websites, have started ways to connect and help the other kids coming out and not just kids, any adults coming out as well, but it's primarily the second generation. You know, it reminds me of what's happening now in Parkland where it's the kids that are rising up yep. and, um, and, and forcing the issue of gun control. And I, I think the, the second and third generation of, of cult members is we're seeing that same level of activism and inspiration and desire to help and sometimes it's helped just their own group but more than likely if you came to them from another group they're going to help you too you know it's not exclusive um but it it's been a long time i mean you know safe passages has been around for a long time they don't have any big donors nobody knows about them you know somebody might give a hundred bucks here and there but um so it's a it's a long it's a long struggle and one of the reasons I wrote the book was to raise awareness about this. I mean, the book was written primarily for the kids um, to, to be able to see what worked and what didn't work for other kids who left their groups uh, and to help them, you know, give them that framework to help them understand what happened to them um, uh, on an emotional and a psychological level. But I also, Carla and I also wrote the book to try to educate the public that this is a huge issue and to educate helping professionals, whether it's lawyers, doctors, first responders, certainly therapists, um, so that when someone walks into your unemployment office or someone walks into your domestic violence shelter and you say, well, I can't help you because you really don't qualify for domestic violence, or someone you know, turns up at your social work office, people will be able to help, help and recognize because the, the kids don't always know how to talk about it. And when they do start to talk about it, they're looked at like they're, you know, some kind of oddball or people don't believe them, right? They, and and there just isn't the awareness of this population for which we have no resources as a society. And it's, to me, it's just criminal. You know, yeah. and I, I, the other story that, that I think is a perfect example of this, I don't know if you've gotten to that part yet, but it was a young woman from... Uh, 12 tribes who uh, was out of the group. She was living in uh, California and she went to a support group, uh, some kind of support group. And the leader of the support group, therapist, whatever he was, I don't know, um, you know, had interviewed her before he allowed her to be in the support group. And he said to her, um, maybe it was for homeless kids. I don't know what it was for. But anyway, he said to her, 
now I don't want you to talk about your experiences or your story in the group because it's so horrific. It'll really upset the other people in the group. And she said, and she thought to herself, here's a guy in the group who had these alcoholic parents and his father stabbed his mother and then he stabbed his father or, you know, whatever it was, something awful like that. And she's like, and he can talk about that. And I'm not able to talk about my experience in the cult that I grew up in. Like, what, why should I even be in this support group? Well, what, how, what kind of support is that? Exactly. And not so much that, of a support group. <laughs> right. And that's the kind of things that, that these kids encounter. I mean, they're adults, but I, I call them kids because they grew up in the cult. You know, they, it's like one roadblock after another. And until often, in many cases, they just despair. They despair. And the suicides, I mean, there's... I mean, just in the last two weeks, the suicides that I've learned about, I just went to a memorial service uh, for a, one of the granddaughters of the leader of the Children of God who died. And all the, all the people there were recounting one suicide after another in their own families because they had so many kids. So they had nine siblings. Two of them have already committed suicide. One of them's on heroin. The other one's... A, it, it's horrendous. And they don't know where to go. Right. Um, and yeah. so... That that's been my my drive and my passion for this book, and my co-author feels the same way. She herself grew up in a cult, and um, I'm just really glad I found her, and and uh, we work together well, and 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 I just really hope that the book makes some impact, that does some help for this. Well, it's it's uh, and that's why I wanted to promote it again. It's Escaping Utopia. Uh, it's available on Amazon, uh, and uh, I will put a link to the book. Uh, here on the description to this video. Oh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it is well worth reading um, and uh, learning about this uh, this this model and their stories. You know, the the it's it's we look at survivors of of cultic groups. We talk about Scientology a lot on my channel. We talk about other groups. Um, the 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 physical abuses, the psychological abuses that go on. Suicide uh, and the, you know, when we talk about these groups taking lives or ruining people's lives, that is the ultimate expression of that, uh, mm -hmm. is, is your life is literally wasted and gone uh, mm -hmm. as a result of involvement in this group. And that has happened far too many times too with, many. The, with these groups. And, and our efforts to fight back against this are not just efforts to try to make it so people don't get scammed out of some money. Yeah, that's important. But we're literally trying to save lives. Yes. <laughs> you know, with this, that's yeah. it's not overstating the case to yeah. to, to put it yeah. that way. You yeah. know. Yeah. yeah. And I I think it's important we keep that perspective and get that reality check sometimes. And I'm really glad that you that you brought that up. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate your passion for the cause. <laughs> Big time. I yeah. Well, you know, I I spent far too long, wasted too much of my life, uh, following a madman. And uh, that two madmen, actually, and uh, and I can't get those years back, but I can certainly make a better use out of the rest of my life. Okay. So that's the goal here, uh, yeah. Yanya. I really want to thank you for for doing this, and and I'm glad we could arrange the time finally to make this happen. <laughs> right. uh, this has been very very uh, informative. I, I hope uh, I hope everybody else uh, agrees and. Uh, is there any, I mean, you're kind of retired now, so, you know, I, is there, you're not still necessarily out there, you know, trying to solicit oh, no. people contacting you and stuff, but is no, there? No, I am. Oh, I am. I'm you retired. are. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm okay. retired from the university. Okay. Uh, but, but I'm still very involved uh, with cult work, talking with cult people. I'm working now on a TV series. Um, I have my website, cultresearch.org. Okay, uh, that was what I was yeah. going to ask, is how do yeah. people and reach you? Way, yeah, that's a way for people to contact me. There's a little form you can fill out, and it comes directly to me. And, um, oh, yes, I, I, you know, sometimes I think, oh, my God, you know, I, I sometimes get overwhelmed by, by the number of calls, learning about new cults every day, you know, hearing about the family in Southern California that had their kids locked up for all those years, you know, that was a family cult, yep. you know, and sometimes I think I have to, I have to let this go. I have to just go travel around the world, but I know I won't, you know, and like you, I'm, I'm turning a bad thing into a good thing. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I'm working on this TV series right now and the um, producers and the production team 
have been so impressed by everyone they met and their dedication to wanting to help. I mean, they said they, they, they don't think they've ever encountered that with any other group of people, whether it's second gen or adults who've come out um, in so many cases, and certainly with second gen, the, um, the desire to be active, to take action, to do something, to raise awareness, to help someone survive another day. I mean, it, it's just phenomenal, that drive um, that, that exists among this population of people. It is. It's admirable and amazing, the resiliency of people yeah. uh, and the basic goodness that is there, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. and when it's allowed to come out, people can do amazing things. Yeah. I guess once you look in the face of evil, that's all you can do. That's <laughs> right. Goodness. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> all right, Yanya. Well, thank you very much thank for this. You. And uh, and perhaps we will talk again in the future. Yes. I'd love to talk with you again. This has been really enjoyable for me. And thank you so much. Absolutely. All right. Bye-bye, folks. Bye.